Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer and my guest this week is Trip Overholt. And Trip is, he's a guy who do so, does something very similar to what I do. Um, in fact, you're doing it in the way that I originally intended to do this, which was on a low power FM radio station in my town huh. uh, with the thought of kind of putting it out there on the internet also. And my low power FM radio station just didn't want to do it and I couldn't figure out why. It seems like they would. We're in a town where everybody meditates and there's all this spiritual stuff going on, uh, just like yours. You're in, you're in um, the Boone, North Carolina area, aren't you? And uh, Yeah. And um, but So they kind of forced me into doing it as a video at the local public access TV station, which turned out to be great because it made me do, do this as a video. And But they didn't have their act together, so eventually I figured out how to do it on Skype and <laughs> started doing that. Now, now this TV station does have their act together, and they're airing my shows that I record this way. So anyway, that's my story in a nutshell. Um, let's, let's hear more about yours. Well, smart move, because I think people prefer this information on video. Because mm -hmm. uh, if you go to the people that we've interviewed, you can see that they like to put up the videos up on, the, on their websites. Right. Uh, in, instead of uh, a radio interview. So I think that was a wise decision on your part. Um, we're not doing our show anymore. We, we aired our last broadcast in June. Oh. But, uh, what made you decide to stop doing it? We just felt like uh, we had done it. We'd done it for three years, and we'd interviewed about 80 people. Mm -hmm. And we decided it would be uh, it would be a good thing to turn it into an ebook, um, so that more people could have access to it and kind of clean it up and okay. make it more more accessible. As I understand it, from having read the first part of your book, um, you yourself had a spiritual awakening, which I suppose was somewhat the inspiration for your doing the show that you did. Is that true? And could you talk about that whole experience? Yeah, I wouldn't have had any interest in doing the show if I hadn't had that experience, mm -hmm. um, which happened back in 2006. And um, ironically, it happened in the bedroom of my uh, friend and spiritual mentor, John Troy, who I do the radio show with. Mm -hmm. That's kind of ironic. But uh, up until that point, I had been someone who was interested in uh, having a great life and improving myself. You know, but I really hadn't had an overt interest in spirituality. In fact, I didn't really understand it. And when I looked at uh, sort of wise men that I would occasionally come across, you know, you'd see these Indian gurus and stuff. Mm -hmm. I had like no idea what that was about. I, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't get it at all. Um, but um, I had had uh, spiritual experiences on psilocybin mushrooms um, numerous times. Uh, and I'd been feeling just absolutely absorbed into love on those, you know, during those times. But then, you know, you'd come down and you'd be back into your identified self and things would be normal again. But I was walking through the wizards. Uh, I call my friend John the wizard. I was walking through his bedroom and there was a, a picture book of Ramana Maharshi's. In fact, it's, it's this book right here. Um, I, I just, let me see here. Can you mm -hmm. see that? Yeah, yeah uh -huh. I've seen that okay. book. It's and, nice. And it, and it, the type on the pages was really large. You see that? Right. Mm -hmm. And because the type was large, I stopped and I, I read a line. And I, I picked up the book and I read a couple more pages. And I had a complete meltdown. Tears were streaming down my face. And I suddenly realized that this localized sense of of, a, of personhood that I'd had that had been between my ears, this guy called Trip. I suddenly realized that it actually wasn't located there. There was actually everywhere. It was mm -hmm. sentience was actually infinite and that I was in fact that field of awareness. And that uh what was remarkable about that was that it happened when I was just straight and, you know, walking around. <laughs> <laughs> and number two, that it stuck. Yeah. It never that that profound awe over that reality never left. It hasn't left uh, since then. So. Does it leave when you go to sleep? Well, when I say never leave, I mean um, I've had stretches of complete re-immersion in, in total uh, sense of myself as a separate guy called Trip, just like um, I used to be. Uh, but increasingly now, I would say that uh, even when I'm in a heated argument or... or 
almost during any activity, uh, a portion of my attention is now enjoying attention itself. Yeah. And that, and do you know what I'm talking about? Absolutely. In yeah. fact, I find it difficult to have a heated argument because there's so, such a major portion of me that, you know, finds that to be ridiculous indulgence <laughs> in, in individual, you know, whim. And, you know, it's like I can't take it seriously. <laughs> I, yeah. It's like yeah. you're watching a movie and, and you know, it, you can't really – you know, be totally convinced that there's monsters on the screen or something. You know, you know yeah. you're you know you're in a movie theater. So the yes. you know, whereas if you completely forgot you were in a movie theater, maybe some people get that overshadowed in movies. Yeah. It could be you know a really traumatic experience watching the monsters. <laughs> exactly. So you know, I, almost inevitably, if there's a heated a p opportunity for a heated experience, I'll go. Am I going to indulge myself in this? Yeah. You know? And sometimes I do. Uh huh. Know? Sure. Yeah. I suppose it depends on the. You know, I don't know. Uh, per personally, I usually find that such things are counterproductive, and I think, you know, do I really want to create all this emotional trauma for myself and others by getting into this, or would it be better to just hold my tongue and, and wait five minutes and the whole thing will be over? <laughs> There's that sort of <laughs> discrimination to, to be able to not um, completely go with any whim that pops into your head. Yeah, well, I was a... a my persona is one of a kind of a cage rattler, you uh -huh, know, yeah. and and so um, I still have some lingering sentiments that arise from that persona. And one of them is that I think that sometimes maybe anger is a useful emotion. It might be good for the person. It's being oh, yeah. directed to, sure. you know, sometimes people do need to be need a little dose of anger because they're accustomed to not um, really listening up to anything other than that. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes so. And just about any sort of guru you read about who is reputed to be extremely enlightened, you know, there are stories about them getting really angry with, you know, this or that person for various reasons. So if we can hold them as an example, then maybe that is an illustration of, of your point. Yeah. <clears throat> did you um, only interview 32 people who are in your book, or did you interview a great many and then you just selected 32 interviews to, to put in the book? Yeah, we winnowed them down. Mm -hmm. um, John made the selection process. Mm -hmm. uh, John's kind of been established as presence for a while. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he was the one that made the decisions. And basically, uh, I would say that the ones that we, um, that we picked would be the ones that most epitomize the qualities of what we would call an avant-garde sage. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be uh, people that are... are uh, generally um, not caught up in some kind of guru persona um, mm -hmm. and who are usually in the woodwork. They're usually unknowns. So often they were um, interested in being on the program and agreed to come on the program. Um, they just, they were usually very fresh and um, authentic and simple loving people with just big hearts. And it's hard to kind of completely put them all in one basket but sure you can kind of tell uh, when you meet one you know? yeah well I would say that none of your guests who you know many of whom have also been my guests and and or will be um, would comfortably um, relate to the word guru but you know guru just means teacher and, and it actually is composed of two Sanskrit roots which mean darkness and light so it's a teacher who can lead you from darkness to light um, and that's what these most of these folks try to do you know if you if you listen to what Francis Lucille is doing or you know um, Rupert Spira or, or many of the others you know they're helping people awaken um, and so traditionally they would be called gurus but you know it's there's there's a lot of baggage with that term <laughs> yeah and so I can understand why people wouldn't want to use it yeah now that I'm you know kind of processing the question a little more I would say that one of the main features is uh, looking out at others with an equality of vision mm -hmm. so the quote teacher and most of them didn't did not want to be called teacher either um, <laughs> what do you got to call them <laughs> most of them some of them were okay with teacher but most of them didn't want to be teacher either uh you know they're looking out with eyes of utter utter equality they're yeah. seeing they're seeing they're god seeing god mm -hmm. they're not on some teacher platform looking at a student yeah 
But, you know, I mean, appearances can be deceptive. I just spent five days with Ama, the hugging saint, and she's definitely up on a platform and people revere her and she has worldwide fame and a massive following and all that. First thing she does when she comes into the hall every time is bow her head to the floor and bow to everybody in the audience. You know, there's there's a, and and I've heard her many times describe her own experience as being, like you said, God seeing God. There's just seeing one oneness in everything seeing every everyone as that presence or god awareness or whatever you want to call it um you know but roles are played obviously and um, she's playing a that sort of role and has certain qualifications for playing it um so i'm i'm just not um you know personally i'm not anti guru I, I i think a lot of gurus have done a lot of things to to uh, sully the term <laughs> uh but that you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There, there are some who kind of um, do justice to the term. There, there are people who, uh, in my, okay, in my opinion, uh, an excellent teacher or a guru is one who never lets go by the opportunity to redirect the adulative attention of the so-called student back onto themselves or mm -hmm. on or onto each other. I think that a teacher has an obligation to continuously reflect that back to the person uh, to be a good teacher because otherwise the student gets the impression that the teacher has something that they don't have. Yeah, and, and you know, it's like I'm really fond of the term paradox um, because almost anything you say, you can find things to contradict it, but they don't disprove it or refute it. The, uh, the world is full of contradictions which are simultaneously true, each in their own domain, each in their own realm. Um, so in a sense, nobody has anything that, that anybody else doesn't have, you know? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they do. Uh, so on relative levels, it's like, let me take an example. Um, the 15 watt light bulb, little night light, and the powerful searchlight that you know warns ships off the rocks they're both drawing their they're, they both have the same fundamental source the electrical field and they're both you know plugged in presuming uh, those powerful searchlights are 120 volts I don't know if they are but they're both they're both you know you know t they, they both if they could if they could go deep enough they would both say yes I am this electrical field this 120 volt 60 cycle per second field that's what I am essentially but uh, from the outside so to speak in terms of their individual f structure and their f and the function which that structure is capable of performing there are vast differences and both so both are true at the same time so you know somebody who's psychotic in a mental hospital or something they essentially are that same being you know self that Ramana Maharshi is or was or whatever how you want to put it but they're not capable of performing the same function mm -hmm. The wiring is screwed up, and mm -hmm. so, so they can't be of the same use to people as he was. They're, they're serving their own function. If you want to say it this way, they're God experiencing psychosis, whereas Ramana Harshi was God, you know, an ex a manifestation ex with enough refinement to experience himself as God, as, uh, rather than this confused, miserable person. Yeah. The thing I sometimes wonder about is, uh, and I and, and it's just you know, uh, useless speculation. It has no no purpose. But I sometimes wonder about uh, the teacher or the student that's interested in the situation where there's a kind of a talking head at the front of the room mm -hmm. who's giving excellent information, um, versus. Uh, a situation where there's no talking head at the front of the room, but everyone is engaging everyone as an equal, and there's just continuous affirmation and acknowledgement of each other as divinity itself playing itself out. And so mm -hmm. um, the wizard and I, we have gatherings that we do, and I just had a gathering in my house on July 3rd, and it was, it was off the charts because it was just a total love fest where everyone was engaging everyone like that. You know, there was no there was no real need or benefit of having a kind of focused attention on a centralized teacher. The thing was playing it, uh, itself out in kind of you know the 3D environment right there. And yeah. people people had a profoundly ex 
experience, had a fantastic experience. So I prefer that over kind of the classroom setting uh, of, of a teacher or anything you know like that, where there's a person at the head of a mob or a big gathering. I prefer just people interacting. That's just yeah. a personal preference. Yeah, no, that's cool. Um, and it has its place, and it is a preference. I mean, if if Mar if Ramana Maharshi walked into that gathering in your house, I think everyone would have sat down on the floor and gathered around him and and listened to hear what he had to say. It wouldn't be like, "Hey, dude, have a beer," you know. <laughs> there would have been some kind of respect or some kind of recognition that there was uh, an example here of a great deal of spiritual maturity, and perhaps we could benefit by tuning into that. And so perhaps the right then and there, the the sort of the head of the room figure dynamic would have set itself up. But that, that that wasn't going on. It was just a bunch of your fo your peers all gathered together, having uh, you know a, a mutually enlightening, enlivening experience. I think that's true. But I also think that we live in different times, and we don't really know what a Ramana Maharshi would look like in 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 today's times. Um, would he be looked over? Would he be given the respect? Um, I. I find that uh, whatever wisdom that I have to share is playing out in kind of a rough and tumble environment here mm -hmm. with a lot of competing stimulation and people with short attention spans. And um, furthermore, you know, if you're if you're a local person and your local friends are coming, it's often hard for people that have known you a long time to recognize the fact that you may have matured significantly spiritually. Mm -hmm that yeah. you may have something to offer. So it may be that that sharing has to take place amidst all of that noise and preconditioned ideas about who you are and everything. And so um, I don't know. Um, I look at some of the um, guys that I think are fantastic sages. Like I've interviewed Scott Killaby, like you have, and, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and Rupert, and I'm looking at my list of people here, Francis Lucille or whatever. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know that they ever uh, necessarily receive the kind of uh, kind of really focused kind of respect that you might fan fantasize that someone like Ramana might receive, but they're completely uh, established as presence. So I think it's beautiful. I, I would accept that with a proviso, w with, with sort of a with, by putting the word completely in italics. Um, yeah. Okay. Because I think there are degrees and degrees and degrees and degrees of establishment or, or embodiment of presence. And I, you know, if, if, you say, if we kind of like take the Vedic tradition as any sort of authority, they, they outline at one point uh, 16 kalas, which are said to be like levels of evolution. And human, you know, rocks are at one end and Krishna or something is at the other end and, and humans are said to occupy maybe four through seven or four through eight so you know Ramana Maharshi would have been an eight maybe um, and then there are eight above that uh, which would all sorts of higher beings that are said to exist in the universe and we could take that as you know theory or speculation but um, personally I kind of resonate with that notion that uh, there's never any there's never any change in, in presence itself. It's like the electricity. It is what it is. But there's, you know, you can go from a 15-watt bulb to a 25, to a 50, to a 100, to a 1,000. There's no end to the upgrades mm -hmm. <laughs> of the degree to which presence can be lived. And, and with those upgrades, it's not only a matter of, um, you know, more and more and more uh, it, se it seems silly to say more presence, but really the the sort of degree of clarity and uh, degree of transmission or, uh, of that through one's mind body structure, but also you know all sorts of uh, subtle faculties begin to develop as that presence permeates more and more into one's makeup and um, you know, you see that in the greatest masters, uh, you know, you read Yogananda's book or various things, there are all sorts of um, capabilities, which, you know, a person might say, oh, I don't care about that, I, all I care about is presence, but nonetheless, that's the, w that's the direction that it goes in as further developmental stages are uh, reached. I totally agree with you, but I think um, one danger with the truth of the fact that there are these uh, very well developed, say, uh, possibilities for presence as in a Ramana or a Nisargadatta mm -hmm. is that people tend to focus on that 
as this potential end game for themselves right. rather than realizing the tremendous benefits that come from just a thimble full of enlightenment if you will and mm-hmm. so for example with my with myself for example I don't I don't begin to even try to compare myself with the Ramana Maharshi but I do I am able to compare m- with myself with who I was like 10 years ago yeah, yeah. and and there is a uh, I have a, a there's a radiant joy that that is constantly present right here in my chest area which I can simply give attention to and feel this joy it's a causeless joy there there's a comfortability in my skin and there's a capacity to engage people in a really deep way without wanting to turn away mm-hmm. I used to I used to look in in other people's eyes and I really couldn't hold their gaze because there was a fear there I guess of really being completely seen or I don't know, it was maybe a fear of being loved on some degree. There was a mm-hmm. kind of a shame, a kind of a shame mixed in. I think there's a, um, I think that almost every person um, has this shame uh, on, on some degree where they don't really feel deserving of being loved. Mm. And so because we don't feel deserving of being loved, we're not able to really fully love others. Mm-hmm. And so when these opportunities used to come up where there'd be a moment where I'd really engage someone, I could only handle it for a few seconds or so, you know? Yeah. Now I just, I just love to engage people. I love to look at them and appreciate them. And so I perceive that there's uh, a tremendous amount more ripening that's going to happen within this form here, but I'm really pleased with what's already occurred. And so I want to, I want people to know that, even a, a small amount of enlightenment, if you will, is going to really make a huge difference. In the oh, I, I completely agree, and um, you know, and that's my experience also. Um, and you know, it's funny to think about how adaptable we are as as human beings. We, you know, it's it's almost like I think of it sometimes as God's mercy that we can be comfortable to a certain extent wherever we are in this great in the big picture of things because if you were to somehow suddenly go back to where you were 10 years ago the contrast would be agonizing you know you would just be writhing on the floor <laughs> uh, you know and yet and yet 10 years ago you were okay with it you know you yeah. were you were living your life you were doing your thing you weren't like you know agonizing every day um, but now look at the look at the contrast now if you were to somehow you know, step ahead 10 years from now and then get used to that and then jump back to where you are right now you might again be writhing on the floor you know because of the contrast <laughs> <laughs> and yet we just we, we have these adapt we have this adaptability which enables us to kind of make life livable wherever we're at and yep. what, what, one thing I suspect is that as long as there's uh, I, I know in, we can talk about this in non-dual circles. Progress is a dirty word, but I, I don't have a problem with it. As long as there's evolutionary progress taking place, there's ever-increasing joy, and life is um, is wonderful. If if somehow that is thwarted or stymied, uh, or you know, the, then we begin to suffer. We begin to feel like oh, there's something wrong here. I, I, there's some block I've got to clear through. Mm-hmm. What do you think about all that? I agree. <laughs> okay. You better disagree res- with me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so somebody told me that uh, I just received an email yesterday from a guy who noticed that I was going to interview you. and He said that in recent interviews, you had become rather challenging of people who didn't seem to fit into your mold. Uh, did, do you know what he's talking about? And is there any validity to that? Do you have a mold? What's your mold? I can only speculate, but um, I can I can take uh, some some stabs at it. Mm-hmm, um, sure. One of them is okay. One of them is is that there are a lot of people in the spiritual community that are interested in all kinds of what I'll call spiritual phenomena. Okay. Right. Um, I don't doubt o- the veracity. O- huh? Ooga booga stuff, kind of. You mean? Well, they're, okay. They're interested in dimensions. They're interested mm-hmm. in astral projection. They're interested mm-hmm. in um, Palladians. They're interested. Uh, in uh, dead spirits making their appearances. Um, mm-hmm. They're interested in auras, uh, crop circles. Um, also, uh, there are people that are, are interested in this idea of transmission, for example, um, mm-hmm. that they're in a lineage and that they've been anointed by a master 
um, as the direct carrier of some kind of spiritual lineage and that they then have the power to transmit uh, things to other people. Okay. Mm -hmm. All of those things um, are uh, potentially true, but they're completely unnecessary and they're really not worth a lot of attention because divinity is present here and now. It's probably experiential right now. Mm -hmm. And so there's nothing added by um, those kinds of uh, spiritual experiences. And I think they're a distraction. And what happens is people like to sort of carve out their niche where they become sort of the expert in auras or they become the expert in whatever. And or they discovered the secret um, you know, a text that they found somewhere in a cave in Western Pennsylvania, curiously, <laughs> you know, curiously sounding very much like a reworked beta text or whatever. Okay. Right. So um, if somebody's coming from one of those perspectives, then they're going to get challenged by me. Okay. Because no, I'm with you. I, I see what you're saying. And I, again, I agree with you. Um, those things can, can be kind of interesting, you know, they can be like junk food. They're kind of tasty, but they don't like, provide much nutrition um <laughs> and um you know i've gone through phases where i've read about the pleiadians and read you know various things but it's it's more like entertainment you know it's not the it's not the meat of it it's not the nitty-gritty um so there was another uh, perhaps in uh in our in some of the later interviews that we had because they talked about the later interviews yeah um i interviewed some folks uh from a course in miracles uh-huh okay. uh the Course in Miracles, uh, uh, when I, I, I challenged uh, some of the people that were uh, up, up at the top of the Course in Miracles, hierarchy. whatever it is, yeah. um, hierarchy foundation, the, the text in various, throughout the text, um, the way the text is written, um, it's definitely du dualistic in the way it's written. Mm -hmm. um, it talks about an, ex an externalized God. Huh. Uh, this God in the text is is a uh, it's capitalized. Capital letters are used so that it becomes this noun. Okay, mm -hmm. and I would I would understand the the goal of the text. The sh the purpose of the text is beautiful and it's been wonderful. But the text itself, in certain places, um, reads like you know there's an externalized God. It's also very Christian. It's very kind of Jesus oriented or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I would. I challenged, for example, I challenged the hierarchy on this, and when I challenged them, they said, well, here's what she really meant to say. You know, <laughs> it, 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 and I said, well, okay, well, you have control of the text. Why don't you change it? Yeah. You know? And then we had long conversations later, and I was okay with the fact that they didn't feel like changing it, okay? Mm -hmm. But I am, like I said, I got a Cage Rattler persona, and if there's a person or a text or a teaching that gives anyone that's exposed to it any idea other than the fact that they are present divinity and that the now is an absolutely complete experience and there's nothing more that can be added to it and that it's absolutely fulfilling when directly experienced if they're gonna if they're gonna pretend that there's anything else that you need beyond that they're gonna get challenged by me because I know that's not true mm -hmm. you know yeah so. Yeah, I would I would agree with that again, um, with the proviso that people are at different stages in their spiritual development, and you know it's like there's a whole lot of fundamentalist Christians in this country. I couldn't be one. I couldn't even sit through one of their sessions, one of their services. But for those people, you know, it, it may not be the highest teaching that could that uh, you know exists on earth, but for those people, it fits for now for them, and um, mm -hmm. you know. 10, 20, 30 years from now, for some of them, it may not fit anymore. In fact, we know people, you've, you and I have both probably met people who, you know, are kind of now into non-dual teachings and all, who at one point went through that kind of a phase. Um, so I just sort of feel like, you know, the, the universe is vast and varied, and there are all sorts of um, streams in, in the spiritual, uh, you know, watershed that people might find themselves in at any given time ultimately they're all leading to the ocean uh, but they might be quite far from the ocean in in their characteristics uh, at any given at any point you know what I mean to get the metaphor I do, I do 
know what you mean, and I and also want to say that I, I, I grew a bit in my outlook. Uh, I was holding spiritual teachers to a higher standard. Mm -hmm. I was differentiating spiritual teachers as being some kind of special category. Uh -huh. yeah. And when I uh, was encountering some particularly obvious foibles in the way they were teaching that was clearly narcissistic or, you know, clearly, uh, you know, enjoying the adulation that was being poured on them for being an excellent communicator rather than taking the opportunity to put the attention back on the student or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I had a personal charge about that. I was holding them to a higher standard and judging them for that. And towards the end of the interviewing, I came around to seeing that I was doing that, and I've let go of that. Mm. No, that's good. I mean, it's good to remember that spiritual teachers are human beings. <laughs> it's good for them to remember it, and they don't always remember it. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> but at least it's good for us to remember it, because otherwise you're going to be disillusioned. Um, you know, I mean, I, I've you know, been in close association with a couple of very well-known spiritual teachers. And, you know, there's a lot of followers who feel like, oh, you know, this teacher is omniscient. They must actually be tuning into the conversation we're having right now. And then at a certain point, you know, something happens. Well, Amma, for instance, there's a lot of people who feel that. I, I politely differ with them without trying to you know, shatter their faith or anything. I just sort of feel like, well, sh she's operating in a human body, and a human body doesn't have that capability. And there's this one woman that I had this conversation with <clears throat> over the years, kept having it, and Amma gave her some sort of advice with regard to her health, and it turned out later on that she had breast cancer and didn't know it, and the advice was inappropriate. And she was, her faith was like, really, sh you know, she was so shaken by that because I thought she was omniscient. How come she didn't know about my breast cancer? And I said, because, you know, she's not omniscient. You should have gotten a, a scan or something. So I think if we, if we deify teachers uh, to, to whatever degree, um, even though they might be the, you know, very rich, mature, full embodiments of God, they're not God in a manifest form. They're not functioning as God. They can't create universes in, through their human body, uh, nor can they be omniscient through their human body. And if we think they can, we're, we're in for a, a little disillusionment at some point. Yeah, and I, I think there's kind of two categories of teaching that take place just to be kind of grossly, you know, categorical. Um, mm -hmm. And again, I might... I might ruffle some feathers by this ob observation I'm going to make because it's not always true, okay? Mm -hmm. But it seems to me, in the vast majority of the cases of the people that I interviewed on our program, I would say 90% of them had some sort of spiritual experience, for lack of a better term, where in the waking state, they had a profound realization that they were more than just the mind and the body, okay? Right. Mm -hmm. And it stuck, okay? Yeah. Okay, those people, when they go out and they get they they go then and hang out with a spiritual teacher like I have for the last five years, with with the wizard in your with case. the wizard in my case, the purpose of that was to clear any lingering doubts mm -hmm. and to affirm to affirm this experience that I had as being true that that was actually true. It wasn't mm -hmm. just a fleeting um, mistake or something of perception. All right? Yeah, in that case. The, the teaching um, was uh, taking place on the heels of an already accomplished fact of a kind of paradigm shift in perception, all right? Mm -hmm. Then you have most people, though, that appear not to have had that kind of a waking state transformation taking, take place, and then they go and they go see a, a spiritual teacher, okay? In that case, what happens is the spiritual teacher gives them this temporary charge, if you will, mm. where in the presence of such clarity and such presence, they're able to palpably experience that as mm -hmm. who they are, okay? Yeah. And then they go off, and then they have to come back and repeat it, you know? Mm -hmm. that's, called hell, that's called the hell of seeking, all right? And in my opinion, that kind of seeking is, I, I don't know if I can say it's completely futile, but I look, I look at it, and it doesn't look like a happy thing to me. It, it looks like kind of a waste of time. Um, so what should they do? I think that the number one thing they can most do is to be as utterly and completely themselves as they can possibly be, which mm -hmm. means accept themselves, accept their foibles, accept their, their looks and their whatever it is about them, 
And when you become so completely comfortable with yourself that you're able to really love yourself, mm -hmm. then uh, a lot of these anxieties and things that are causing all the mind chatter that blocks grace coming in and delivering a profound experience of who you are or even a subtle experience of who you are, that mind chatter goes away because you're not grinding away on all these concerns that you have. And so it'll take care of itself if you really accept yourself, I think. You know? Okay. Well, presuming they can really do that, great. Um, but is there any reason why they shouldn't do both? Is there any reason why they shouldn't do what you just said and also go and see you know, some teacher that passes through town and get a little shot of Shakti? I don't think that they have any choice in it. I think that um, they're going to see that teacher because that's what has been written for them. You know, that's what they so, feel like doing. I mean, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. They say, but, "Oh, oh boy, Francis Lucille's in town. I think I'll go sit with him." Yeah, I think you know? it's fine. I think it's great. Yeah, I think there's something to be said for the old cloth and dye analogy that they sometimes use in Indian spirituality where you take a white cloth and dip it in the colored dye and then put it out and bleach it in the sun for a while and it loses its color but it becomes a little bit color fast a little bit of the dye is retained and then you do that again you, and you keep repeating that process until eventually the, the cloth is the same color whether it's in the vat of dye or sitting in the bright sunlight mm -hmm. so I, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with these intermittent flashes of realization that are then lost um, something changes when that happens and even if you kind of totally lose awareness of what had happened you know a week later you're back at work and everything's crazy and you've totally forgotten about it I think on some deep level there's been some shift and those those little micro shifts can kind of accumulate to the point where there's a permanent realization of the nature of your own um, uh, so I don't have a problem with that. And I think meditation does the same thing. It can do the same thing. You're not sitting with a teacher, but you're you're going within and having this experience, and then you seem to lose it afterwards, maybe. But there's some little change, so maybe even some physiological change, and then you, you repeat the process. And over time, you know, you as some Zen teacher once said, uh, you know, enlightenment may be an accident, but spiritual practice makes you accident prone. <laughs> you kind of there's a kind of a culturing or a, you know, a, a, a gradual transformation that can bring you to the brink of a, 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 an abiding realization. Well, we're on an we're on an agree fest right now. <laughs> okay. So I don't have any. I'm not one of these people that says, "Oh, practices. You should just drop all practices because they're only going to reinforce the the sense of a practicer." You know, I, I just don't look at it that way. I agree with you, but I will say that um, there's a tendency on the part of people who seem to be interested in cultivating their spiritual life mm -hmm. to carve out this part of their life that they call spiritual, okay? Mm, yeah. So they look forward to, say, the weekend retreat with the great teacher. Or right. Meanwhile, though, right now, walking around in your underwear, um, feeding the kitty, and going down to the grocery store is every bit as spiritual. So um, that's where the rubber meets the road, and... So I ask myself why, it's just a personal preference thing, but for me, um, I want to enjoy the miracle of this present divinity 24-7, uh, wherever I am, with whomever I am, and, and I do, and, it's, and I, I partly ascribe it to a firm conviction that there is nothing outside of any present moment that's more spiritual than any other, and therefore... Why, why waste the fuel? I mean, if you want to, it's fine. But my point would be as a celebration. If, if you're going down to the grocery store and you're finding it really drecky and not fun because it's not a spiritual environment with the kind of people you want to hang out with, then I would say that's where the work is. And I would say, make that your, uh, your spiritual practice. And then when going to the grocery store, is just as spiritual, then uh, go back to the retreats and enjoy them even more because it's just putting a punctuation mark on it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I know what you're saying. I actually know two or three people who've had a profound uh, awakening while serving time in federal prison. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there was Satyam Nadim, there was a guy named Ed Beckley. I have a friend right now who's in prison. He did some kind of financial scam. and you know, <laughs> I don't know if he's had an awakening yeah. there, but, he, but I've actually been corresponding with him and and he feels like, you know, all is well and wisely put, and he's really growing 
um, and yeah. you know learning and in, in under those circumstances so and I, also if you you know if we really do feel that you know God is this omnipresent intelligence that is kind of governing the universe from within not from afar but from within every particle of it is, is present then there's a, a vast intelligence innate in every experience whether at the grocery store or picking up the dog poops or whatever you're doing there you know, everything is brimming with that that intelligence and um, and it's you know there's inherent value in every experience mm -hmm. totally yeah hmm. we had a couple on our show Kenny Johnson and a Brian, Brian Adler who's in the book um, yeah I've got they, Kenny coming up in a couple of months he was fun he's really yeah, great <laughs> yeah so prison's a great place you know yeah not that I would want to go there but if the circumstances of my life were such that I ended up there that's probably what where I needed to be you know yeah. uh, and could gain from it yeah. yeah I wanted to ask you some questions about um, sure and you ask good questions by the way I was gonna say that's one thing I like about your interviews and you know I, I intend to actually download all of your interviews and um, then listen to them as I am preparing for that particular person that you know I'm gonna be talking to but I always I'm impressed by the fact that you really seem to have the time to read the books of all these people <laughs> you know it's like I'm really lucky if I have half an hour before bed to read a little bit <laughs> but uh, I, and you ask very you know well prepared insightful questions so I just wanted to, to say that thank you very much yeah um, I felt if somebody's gonna spend a year of their life you know, writing a book, then mm -hmm. I have I, I feel that to be thorough, I should read their book. So that was another reason that we wrapped up the show from my end of it is I was spending about a day and a half a week getting ready for those interviews. Yeah, um, I, yeah. I listen. I have my iPod and I'm cutting the grass, riding my bike, brushing my mm -hmm. teeth, washing the dishes, you're doing things like that. And yeah. I put in at least an hour a day listening to these mm -hmm. folks while I'm preparing. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I would go onto your site and oftentimes your interviews would be good prep for me. You know, mm, yeah. Oftentimes you you get a lot more out of an hour interview than you do out of reading a book. I mean, in terms of what you would want to interview somebody about, because yeah. they bring up so much juicy stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I, what are some of your reports from the field? I mean, I've come to some conclu some conclusions about the folks that we've interviewed and the state of affairs here of non-duality and. I don't know. I mean, how do you um, do you foresee yourself continuing to do these interviews for a long time? They're continuing to be rewarding for you. And you know? absolutely. I, in fact, I wouldn't mind at all if this morphed into a career um, that I could do full time for the rest of my functional life. Um, I really enjoy it. I get new requests and recommendations every day. Uh, my hardest task is prioritizing people because I only do one a week and I've got got people scheduled into next winter and it's really hard to sort of like shuffle them around in, the, in some kind of fair order you know so I don't put people off indefinitely and then there are all kinds of people that are hardly known that will be make will make great guests on the show but um, they don't get a lot of recommendations and votes because uh, nobody knows about them and so somehow I, I become aware of those people and I try to squeak them into the into the queue but in any case I really love it um, it's uh, kind of a real boost to my life um, weekly something I look forward to and so I have no plans to discontinue it you do a very good nat job of kind of naturally engaging people and when you interview them you're more more able to kind of run with a thought thread or a conversation thread that's going and kind of develop that my style was more like um, I would go into their work and I would mm -hmm. pick out things that I wanted to know more about, or if I thought there was an inconsistency in there, I'd pick that out and take a look at that or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a slightly different, I too would have, would like to do it as a career, but um, at this point in my life, I need to focus on making a living and. Um, oh yeah, I have a full-time job, but yeah. you know, this is something I wouldn't mind if it morphed in. I'm 60, almost 63 years old, so maybe this will be a retirement thing for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing is there's not enough platforms for people to share from so it's really good that you're doing this you know? yeah and I actually on my site um, people may have noticed that a little bit down if you scroll down there's a, a, a list of similar shows including yours that I link to so I'm you know I don't feel like 
I'm trying to carve out some monopoly here. It's it's more like everybody has their own flavor, and I enjoy listening to other people's things. Um, and so I don't see why any of my listeners shouldn't be notified of other things they might want to listen to. Like if I interview Jeff Foster, for instance, then they might want to, and they like that, they might want to turn around and hear you interview Jeff Foster or, or you know, some other guy, or Richard Miller interviewed Jeff Foster just to kind of, you know, get different takes on the guy. You know, there's a few well-known spiritual luminaries out there. Um, have you contacted some of them to appear on your show? Like, did you ever ask Ram Dass to be on your show or... Um... Gangaji or anybody like that, or uh, Ajishanti, or some of those sort of uh, well-known folks? Well, I've interviewed Gangaji and Ajishanti. They're there. Um, mm -hmm. I, I did uh, inquire about Ramdas, and they said, well, he's very old, and he's, he's had this stroke. He doesn't grant a lot of interviews, so I didn't push it. Yeah, I understand that. Um, there are a few, you know, I'd like to mix it up and have some of the well-known folks and all some of the unknown folks. So. Um, you know, I'd like to get Byron Katie and Deepak Chopra, whom I actually taught his original meditation course when he learned to meditate, and I lived with his parents for a couple of months in India, so I sh shouldn't have trouble getting him, and uh, Eckhart Tolle, I'd like to interview those folks, but um, I also really enjoy interviewing the housewife who just woke up one morning with her kundalini on fire and has gone through all kinds of changes and transformations. I'm actually referring to somebody I did interview named Sorogeny, um, and I think it was one of my best, most interesting guests, uh, interesting interviews. So I know there are some interviewers who really try to get all, only the famous people and the well-known people because they're trying to build viewership. And, and you know, you figure if you interview Eckhart Tolle, then he, all his people are going to sit and listen to it. So I, I can't, I, you know, I confess to a little bit of that notion, but at the same time, I think it's, you know, the, the subtitle of my show is conversation, uh, interviews with ordinary spiritually awakened people. And I like to keep that as, as an emphasis. I hear you. That's my bias. I mean, I have to say that there's nothing more exciting to interview somebody that's really fresh in their and, 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 and just lit up like a Christmas tree with mm -hmm. their newfound realization or whatever. And I just love talking to people like that. Like we had one, uh, Ilona Chunate was an example of that. On yeah, our, she's uh, kind of on. She's on my list. I'll be inviting her soon. Yeah, she was on fire. She was just beautiful. Um, have you interviewed Benjamin Smythe? I did. We had a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, he's a fun guy. Um, yeah. Let's see. Um, and Mary incidentally, uh, be, just I want to say um, this point, point you made about the, the, the person up on the podium, you know, with this I thou relationship with the yeah. audience. Um, there, there can be that dynamic if, if you kind of just, if you think of people like Eckhart Tolle or Byron Katie as super special and you can never be like them. Uh, I think it can keep you following the dangling carrot indefinitely, and you, you got to realize that you know very it's very likely that your own experience might be just as rich as theirs. You just don't have their particular eloquence or you know gifts uh, as a teacher or speaker. But it's it doesn't you know, you might be a you know mopping the floor as a janitor, but your inner experience might very well be just as profound. Yes, and I think it's an important quality for an, an, an interviewer in this category to not be in awe of anybody that they're interviewing and mm. to feel completely comfortable in their own skin and their own realization and mm. to feel that really there is no big quantifiable difference between themselves and the person being interviewed. I think that really adds to the interview because um, it, it allows you to get beyond the kind of superficial questions that an interviewer would want to ask about yeah and go into a deeper place and I think people appreciate that uh, so. yeah and I can be respectful at the same time but there is that that sense of you know uh, we're on the same we're on the same boat here you know <laughs> yeah. um, okay so you were just about to ask me about somebody else oh I don't know um, it's fun you know you go through these people and each one of these avant-garde sages is a, is a different kind of a like jewel you know, mm -hmm. each one is beautiful. Like, for example, Peter Fenner. Did you interview him? He's on my list. I, and I met him out at the Science and Non-Duality Conference, which I hope you'll attend, by the way. It's a really fun tr thing okay. to go to. But um, he, uh, I haven't interviewed him yet. He's, it's, like I say, it's, there's a queue. I do one a week, which means 50 a year. And I'm moving through it. But it's hard to prioritize people. You know, I just I mentioned him as I'm just, I'm just scanning down the list. Because, mm -hmm. for example, I was just blown away by his ability to listen. Ah, nice. 
I did not, for example, this is the kind of stuff you get to, that you pick up from, from interview, being an interviewer on one of these mm -hmm. programs. I would walk away from every interview with something amazing from that mm. person, you know, usually a few little jewels. And Peter Fenner had a, had a way of uh, actively listening with a kind mm. of intent, with a kind of clear mind mm. and, and focus on the person that he was listening to that was just palpable, you know, mm. and it was, it was, it was so, so delicious, it was noticeable, you know, nice. and, and I realized that there was a, a long way for me to be able to go in listening to people, mm. to not, uh, for example, he neither agrees with or disagrees with the information that's being presented. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not going into his cognitive processor, a guy named Peter Fenner who's sitting there wanting to like use it for some kind of egoic advantage. You right. know? He's just with the information, just, mm. with, just with it. You know? I mean, that was, pro that was a profound lesson that I got. Um, so many. Um, That's I a good one. I mean, because it's, it's easy to just try to filter everything through your own conceptual apparatus and and then kind of extract from it the point that you want to make you know as opposed exactly. to just really hearing what the person is said, saying and allowing yourself to be stretched to a, a new perspective yeah um you know another thing that i think is interesting is there are a lot of really young new age sages now for example um Bentinho, Bentinho, right benjamin uh I go down my list here, uh, young women like uh, Lisa Cairns, Maren, sure. Maren Springsteen here on my list, um, mm -hmm. Regina Dawn Akers, she's pretty young. Mm -hmm. um, and um, what's interesting is there, um, I, I, won't, I won't say that um, this is true of, I don't, I don't think this is true, of, or, or Jeff Foster, I don't think this is true of any of the people that I'm mentioning now, but there seems to be this, uh, kind of, um, I call it, it's almost like cafe non-duality or something where, um, hey, like my girlfriend woke up next week and we're, I'm going to wake up at the retreat this week, you know, this weekend or whatever. Right. And it's like, um, it's like, uh, it's like, just like Burning Man has kind of entered the kind of uh, national um, consciousness. I go to Burning Man. It's like non-duality has, has kind of entered the mainstream consciousness to a degree. And people are aware of the fact that you can kind of wake up to a deeper reality and then they think that once that's happened even if that happens they think well okay I got that that's like that's in my hip pocket yeah yeah I got that merit badge <laughs> yeah I got that merit badge and they don't they don't realize that it's like a lifelong ripening that takes place and that like you were mentioning earlier it's just deeper and deeper and deeper and when you interview a guy like Francis Lucille for example mm -hmm. there's just a palpable maturity spiritual maturity there you know um, and I love, I, ab I absolutely love the freshness. The, the young avant-garde sages are like, they're so into like free fall. What you see is what you get, you know. They're mm -hmm. like right now, right in your face. Like I don't need any words. And there's this intimacy and an immediacy. They like to talk into the camera. And there's this whole freshness to it. But on the other end of the spectrum with the Francis Lucilles and the Ruperts and the John Troys, um, and and others, um, Jerry, Jerry Wenstrom, people in their 60s, 70s, 80s. So the mature teachers, it's it's hard for me to kind of give worded description to it, but they're like a fine wine. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just this mellowed, beautiful mellowed kind of at easeness. It's hard to describe. It's a kind of grandfatherly yeah. maturity. Ramana Maharshi had it in spades. It's kind mm -hmm. of this sweet grandfatherly spiritual maturity you just want to hug them and kiss them because they're just <laughs> it's it's hard to say it's just sweet no, you know? i know exactly what you're saying and this is a, a major pet peeve of mine not a peeve but um the term wake up i woke up i had an awakening right. i hear that and i think okay you know fine it's a nice start um, <laughs> keep on trucking, dude. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I, I've actually said 
many times what I've heard you, what I just heard you say, which is that I really enjoy talking to some of these mature teachers like Gangaji and Ajishanti and, you know, Rupert and, and various people because, and Muji is another one I've really enjoyed talking to because there's this sort of appreciation that, you know, the initial awakening is just that and that there's a never ending maturation and deepening into the mystery that, that you know, probably as long as you're breathing is going to continue. Um, so I, I just kind of shy away from the, the term awakening in terms of its kind of static um, superlative connotation. It's, I, I, I see it as a, a milestone, a stage, a, 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 a nice development, but that there's more. In fact, when Adyashanti had his first awakening, he, he literally had a voice say to him, keep going. Yeah. Mm. Another thing that I discovered, and you probably have too, is that, uh, for lack of a better term, sages, avant-garde sages, are all over the place. I mean, mm -hmm. we've interviewed um, warehouse workers, truck yeah. art, uh, truck driver, Norio Kushi, mm -hmm. truck driver, um, teachers, housewives. They're they're all over the place. They're in your community, um, so it's not like. Uh, great teaching or uh, people that are truly deeply established uh, are that rare. Actually, I find it's the rare person who really, really, truly wants to be around that. That's the person that's rare. Um, hmm. It's really ready. Um, and the other thing is that this idea that, um, I don't know, that the general public on some level isn't awake as well. Like I go to, I, I'll grant you that the gatherings that I go to, like there's a beautiful musical festival right near my house. It's called uh, Shikori Hills Musical Festival. Mm -hmm. It's a grassroots festival. And when I go there, I go through the crowd and it's mostly young people. Actually, it's a mixture, but I go through the crowd and I'm, everyone is just so joyous. And so I like to go through the crowd and just um, affirm all the people that I meet. Every single person I I kind of share with them the glorious nature of the present experience that we're sharing and, and, and how divine it truly is and, and how miraculous it is and how absolutely perfect they are and how nothing could be added to this experience we're having right now to make it better. And not only that, that's not only true of right now, but it's true of every one of our moments. And so, you know, let's celebrate this beautiful fact that we're living this glorious reality, you know, and I'll go through a crowd of people and in a given night I might have an exchange of that nature with a hundred people or 150 people or whatever every single one of them gets it yeah every, they'll get it sure yeah you know? well they're they're at a music festival um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know and sure they get it and sure everybody has that spark of divinity within them yeah. if, or whatever you want to call it um, but you know like the infomercial says w but wait there's more you know, so it's again, it's the both and situation for me where it, it, this is perfect as it is and there's more uh, and, and that will be perfect when more unfolds and, and there will be more. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, I guess that's the point. I agree. That's that's so true. I'll also add, though, that I, I think it's very important. This is something that I think is um, true of my it's it, this is true of myself and I recommend it for others. And it's this it's like. The, I, I think it's important to make the statement to yourself, the declarative statement to yourself that I am that, you know, mm -hmm. I am, I am that as totally as Nisargadatta or Ramana Maharshi and truly accept that there is not a shred of daylight in terms of that between myself and Ramana Maharshi, um, because any idea that there is, is just going to keep uh, the direct experience of who you are further away from yourself. You have, have to accept that you are that, you know? And I think that's the biggest obstacle for people on a, quote, spiritual path is to ever give that acknowledgement to themselves, you know? Mm. They, 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 they hold a standard out there of a gifted teacher like an Ajashanti or whatever, and then they, they make this they come up with this idea that they're not that, that they're not just as divine, you know? Yeah, but there's a Tibetan proverb, which I use in almost every interview, which goes like this. 
Don't mistake understanding for realization. Don't mistake realization for liberation. So while it may be true, and we can understand this intellectually, that I am that, just affirming that, and with, even with great conviction, doesn't necessarily mean that the full richness of that experience is going to dawn and, and be lived. There, there could be some work towards that, which it will necessarily, but, but it's good to start with that understanding, which, which, which is- I agree the, with you. You know, but it, it doesn't mean, and, and we understand that it's the, the 15 watt light bulb understands that it is the electrical field and just as much as the big bright lighthouse. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it's shining like the big bright lighthouse. It doesn't. It can't guide ships off the rocks. So as, it could be, and I say this because I I sometimes see people using that concept as a cop out for not doing any sort of spirit, any sort of work to progress f further. They say, oh, I'm that. I'm there. What is there to do? You know, let's party. There's there's. Uh, uh, so I, I, this is just a precautionary note. I was actually having a, f a discussion with, about this with a friend uh, just a couple of days ago who has spent the better part of nine years living in the Himalayas in an ashram, you know, meditating many hours a day. And he actually knew the Sanskrit for this, but there are sort of two streams of thought in, you know, that, you know, the snake was never, it was always a string. It was never a snake. And you just have to realize that, you know, if, you've, if, if you're familiar with that uh, metaphor. And on the other hand, you know, you have to sort of decondition yourself from the deeply seated uh, misconception, misperception of the string as a snake. And, and there are levels and levels of vasanas that are, are impressions in the nervous system that have accumulated over how, who knows how long that aren't just going to go away in a flash just because you have the intellectual under insider understanding that I am that there's going to be stuff to work out agreed but I also think for every Buddha shining up on top of a cliff that's warding off ships there's a thousand that nobody's ever heard of and who have no interest in warding off ships yeah well look at the name of my show Buddha at the gas pump I mean the implication is yeah. you might you might be pumping gas next to a Buddha and not even know it exactly <laughs> Uh, you know, for, for some reason, I was thinking of when I was thinking of your interview. I was I I, I uh, thought of Plato's allegory of the cave, and I actually looked it up and read about it. Remember that from philosophy class? Um, mm -mm. There's, I might well, have read it. Though. Yeah, the way it goes is, you know, people are are in a cave and they're chained in such a way that they ha they have to look at a wall. They can't do anything else but look at the wall. And behind them, there's a fire. And between the fire and them, there are things moving along on a walkway, casting shadows on the wall. And they sit there and look at these shadows and regard the shadows as reality. And they, they try to f understand what the shadows mean. They have arguments about the shadows and so on and so forth. And then somehow one guy gets a little bit loose in his chains and manages to turn around and see what's actually going on. Oh, there's a fire and there's objects moving in. And it's, the light is blinding to him initially and he can't really look at it directly. It, eventually he maybe gets acclimated and maybe he gets out of his chains and then eventually actually steps out of the cave into the full sunlight in which he's totally blinded and overwhelmed and and you know but eventually gets accustomed to that uh, over time and then he kind of goes back into the cave and tries to tell the people who are chained and looking at the wall what's really going on and of course they don't believe him and you know and he can't anymore take their arguments seriously about how the, sh the shadows are being interpreted. It's completely meaningless and <laughs> ridiculous to him because he's seen the whole picture. But I, th I think it's a beautiful sort of analogy for, mm -hmm. um, or allegory for the whole process of, of awakening. Um, the, uh, we could yeah. s you know, delve into it, but I think the implications are, are obvious. <laughs> Read. Yeah. You know, in the, in the um, I think I might have uh, early on in my in my process of becoming more established, and I know there's a long way to go. I probably entertained the fantasy of uh, affecting a lot of people. Like, mm -hmm. wow, this is this is so amazing. I want to affect so I want to affect lots of people. But mm -hmm. as I've matured a bit, I realized that um, there's there's nothing grander about simply affecting every single person that I meet. Yeah. 
with as, with as much love as I can. There's nothing grander about doing it for a stadium full of people. You know, mm-hmm. there's nothing more influential for humanity about that. I don't think so. Um, yeah. Well, we're all yeah. playing our roles, you know, and and you've yeah. actually you actually have chosen a role in which you have affected a lot of people. I mean, doing your show and getting it out there has reached a lot of people. So, mm-hmm. so good on you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but but again, it's a matter of our the role we're cut out to play, and um, and also it's a there's a question of what really produces an effect. I mean, it, it's said in the sort of the mystical tradition sometimes that that some of the people who are sitting in caves or monasteries are having a much bigger effect on the world than those who are out on the world stage doing something very publicly because on a subtle level they're propagating an influence which is influencing everyone. So um, I guess I should mention the book. Did you? The book is Conversations with Avant-Garde Sages. And, uh-huh. um, it's it's free. And yeah. it can be downloaded from the Wizard LLC website. Anybody can download it anytime they want. And what's nice about it is it's not like you have to read the whole thing in one sitting. You just pick any one you want to read, you know? Yeah. And they're about 10 pages long. And and so you can just pick and choose and read as many as you like. And so that's a good thing. You know, I wanted to... Uh, I wanted I'll be, to I'll be linking to that, that, too, by the way, from my website. I'll link to your book and I'll link to your website where people can also download the audios of these things, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So go ahead. They can also go to, well, they also can go to the person's website and get all their stuff too. You know, sure. Um, mm-hmm. So, um, it's funny. Um, I'm, uh, I had this gathering on my property and, uh, I want my place to be a gathering place where people, operate from the presumption of their non-physical reality and their divinity rather than the presumption of being a separate individual mm-hmm. and and that people engage each other with with that intention that they see it's god seeing god everywhere god seeing god and we had such a fabulous time and there was a fire circle and the drummers were magnificent and i just had an idea that i don't know i'll mention to you i thought it would be really fun like you could even, uh, I was thinking of developing, maybe even developing a little performance piece, for example, where um, you would uh, kind of uh, do, do kind of a motivational speaking thing where you get people really excited about uh, what's going on here, and then you bring in, musicians would come in and they would sort of do their thing for a little while, and then you would come back in kind of as a motivational speaker, and then people might get up from the audience and they would participate or whatever and kind of create this maybe traveling roadshow of, uh, you know, almost kind of like a non-dual revival or whatever, you know? <laughs> I would do I this or that. you would do this? or so no, my little fantasy. Yeah, my yeah. little fantasy of, you know, just another way to do this other than interviews or books. Yeah. You know, yeah, it sounds like fun. You could, could go around the country and hit all the hot spots. You know, I mean, you're yeah. you're in one of them, and then there's Fairfield, Iowa, and there's Boulder, Colorado, and there's Santa Fe, New Mexico, and there's you know, all, you know, up and down the West Coast, all, all sorts of places. Yeah, <laughs> and what's imp- what's impressive is how together so many just you know all the ordinary folks. I mean, the people that are that are going to the Adyashanti retreat, or the people that that. It's a just how ma- amazing how talented people are. Ordinary people, they they get up and they're able to play the f- the flute bl- beautifully out of nowhere, or mm-hmm. they can do poetry, or they can do fire dancing, and each one is a beautiful expression. And it would be cool to pull together a, a way for people to really participate and to express this non-dual reality in a joyful way and but but have it be as a kind of a structured performance where people are brought in and do things so i don't know it's just yeah part of the reason part of the reason we wound up the show was to see what else wants to come in you know Mm. what what new thing wants to happen you know cool well that was just keep working on it we'll see what you do um there's another little uh, you know pet peeve that i've had let me see if you picked up on it which is um, a tendency people have to confuse levels, I would put it. 
Um, there's a guy I interviewed named Timothy Conway who wrote, wrote a very n nice article about this. But there, there are, you know, obviously from a physicist's perspective, there are many levels to creation, and they're all dissimilar but simultaneously true, and, and different laws apply on each one that don't necessarily apply on the others. Um, and so true, so with, uh, you know, consciousness or, or perspective, our subjective perspective, I mean, there's a level in which we sense or, or experience that nothing is happening and nothing ever happened. You know, it's a field of pure silence. And there's a sense, uh, there's a level on which we see that things are happening, and yet they're they're perfect just as they are. As, as you've said earlier in this interview, they're, everything is divinely ordained and wouldn't change it a whit. And then there's a level on which things really suck and they should be changed. You know, the starving children and, and child prostitution and all kinds of things that we should you know, de that should be dealt with and changed. And, you know, and there's a tendency for sometimes people to lock into one or another of those perspectives and to say, oh, you know, the starving children, it's not really happening, nothing ever happened. Or the starving children, it's perfect just as it is. You know, it's, it's the way God wants it or something. And what I would say is a really, a more mature perspective, we were talking about maturity earlier, would incorporate all those levels and not pit them against one another. You know, uh, if, if one is called to do so, one could dive into, you know, saving the children and while at the very same time having the perspective that everything is perfect, while at the very same time having the perspective that nothing ever happened, you incorporate all those levels of, of experience simultaneously. Uh, so I call that a pet peeve because I, I among even people I've interviewed, um, I've seen a tendency for people to lock into one or another of those levels to the exclusion or to the refutation of the others. Mm -hmm. I agree. And so I think what's critical is the um, assumption that you make about who you are. So if, for example, if you have made an assumption about yourself that you are a separate person, then as you go about being a do-gooder in the world, let's say, saving children or whatever, mm -hmm. you're going to build up a lot more karma because you're basically kind of in a contractual arrangement with your ego. The wanting to do good is coming out of wanting to be a good guy who maybe gets loved more or receives the affirmation of others or lives up to his responsibility as a Christian. Okay, mm -hmm. And it's going, to be fraught, it's going to be fraught with doership. Okay. Right, or wants that, to convert the children to, to Christianity or, you know, has some right. ulterior motive yeah. or something. Yeah, but there could be anything, and then it could get really weird. And, yeah. um, but, and, then, and then that sense of doership kind of shrinking you down into this, rea you know, ultimately reactive, separate human being who's living in fear. Or, you know, you can become from the assumption of the fact that you are actually divinity i like to say divinity itself i notice most of the teachers don't but i i i say divinity itself you're an everlasting reality you are awareness itself and yes okay so the mortal body is happening the children are starving but when you jump in there from that perspective you're jumping in from a a place of non-reactivity and a beautiful clear space so that you're not building up karma as you go about saving children you know, mm -hmm. you're not being, you're not doing it for egoic reasons or whatever. Um, so I think that that's really the critical aspect is that whatever level you're choosing to kind of jump into or be called to, that it always comes from an understanding of the truth of who you are, you know? Yeah, no, that's a great point. I think it added to the point I just made. It definitely it was something yeah. I, I really had left out, which is that if you do have this broader perspective which incorporates all the levels then you're actually going to be uh, better at not only in terms of not accruing your own karma but you're actually going to be more effective in feeding the children because there'll be a, a broad, kind of a less egocentric um, orientation to the process yes so for example like if um, you're feeding the children and you're doing it from an egoic outlook and then some other organization wants to come onto your turf and feed the children too. Right. You, might get in, you get into an argument with it because, hey, this is these are my kids that I'm saving. You know? Yeah. Let's say it's let's say you're a fundamentalist Christian. You're trying to feed the children, and some Hindu group wants to come in yeah. and feed some too. Then yeah. no, that's the devil. We don't want you in here. <laughs> there you go. We like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, so what we're really talking about here, and oh, obviously we're using feeding children as a just a case in point. There could be a million different 
examples of it, but we're really talking about a, a kind of a mature spirituality which incorporates all levels of life and which doesn't exclude any and which, in, which um, incorporates within itself a lot of paradoxes and is comfortable with that doesn't feel the need to sort of reject everything in order to hold on to a particular thing and yeah I think it's um, it's a good notion to kind of put out there um, because there are numerous violations of it in contemporary spirituality which we might do well to grow beyond yeah, and I think that that is kind of if you will where spirituality mature spirituality has evolved to whereas earlier there was a bit of a, a focus on the absolute, on the nothing, on the void, mm -hmm. of uh, dismissing the temptations of the flesh, of the world, of, you know, uh, kind of going inside and leaving the world out there and going into your cave and, you know, working through all of these um, temptations you might have and being all of that stuff. And now I think people realize that where the rubber meets the road is out there in the chaos, you know, it's being really present to the grocery store checkout person or the poop, <laughs> you know, constantly basically being present to whatever's going on, you know, and that mm -hmm. that's, and that's absolutely where the rubber meets the road and, and, you know, any moment is as spiritual as any other moment. Everyone is God. Everyone you meet is a God send. Um, and then and then living that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So, I'm my my nature is such that I could continue to think up things for us to talk about, but we're sort of rehashing a little bit at this point. We're, um, is there any anything that we've really left out that might be? we might want to cover I, I have no time constraints we can we can take all the time we want but um you know we don't want to bore people but if if you f is there anything you feel like close to your heart that we haven't brought up um well not really i mean i'm <laughs> I, I'm I'm really I'm really grateful for I'm, I I want to say that I'm terribly grateful for the all the folks that came on my program as you must be as well I learned oh, yeah. so, I learned so much from all of them and I'm terribly grateful f to John my my mentor and friend um, and also he did all the work on the book he mm -hmm. he did everything he edited wow. it, did all the work it was hundreds and hundreds of hours um, and more than anything I'm just so pleased and blown away that the existential bummer of existence that I thought was inescapable, except via death, okay? <laughs> I was convinced that the life, only... Yeah. Life sucks, then you die, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I was convinced, uh, up until five years ago, I was convinced that, the, um, that life was an existential bummer, mm -hmm. and that the solution was death, and that it got murky after that, and I could recognize a belief system there that I really didn't have a lot of confidence in about an afterlife and a heaven because it, it just wasn't adding up and because there was a burning hell and all of that. But my gosh, what relief, how fantastic that it can, you actually can transcend the human condition. It can be heaven on earth here and now. And I do feel that way about my life. I feel mm -hmm. this is heaven on earth here and now. And I just want to share with anyone listening that um, it's totally within their reach to experience this and that all it requires is a yearning heart for truth. That's all that's required, you know? Mm. And it absolutely will come to pass and you can count on it and, let, like, rejoice. That's great, and it's very well put. And it actually speaks to another little pet peeve of mine, which is this saying of give up the search, you know, that, that is often uttered very prematurely and indiscriminately you know if you have a yearning heart that's a sense of search and there's nothing wrong with that honor that you know flow with that go with that and see where it leads you don't you know I mean some to my ears give up the search almost sounds like uh, you know just kind of sit on your haunches and wait for something to happen uh, you know be, um, but you know if 
seek and you shall find, as, as Jesus put it. Um, and of course, there is a time and a place for giving up the search when you've actually found. But if you haven't yet, then, you know, read books, see teachers, do some practice, listen to interviews, you know, whatever, whatever floats your boat, um, and it will bear fruit. I agree, and I, I, I'm convinced that if your heart is true and there's a deep yearning in it for peace and for truth, mm -hmm. and if you get yourself to a teacher who is a good teacher and there's plenty of information about, out there about what makes a good teacher, and you just spend company with this teacher, and I think the hallmark of a great teacher is that they don't want anything from you, okay? Mm -hmm. They just absolutely enjoy sharing with you, and if they're a great teacher, they will be, they will be completely excited about your earnestness, okay? They will be overjoyed that you, this earnest person, has come to them because there just aren't that many people that are that earnest, okay? And if you go to a great teacher like that, and you're completely earnest, and you and you have a yearning heart. It's absolutely inevitable that you will come into your own sense of peace, and that you will absolutely find you'll find the heaven on earth that is here and now. It's it's inevitable, you know. Yeah, that's really great, and I hope that I hope a lot of people hear that, and that it <clears throat> encourages and inspires them. Um, there's no reason to be despondent, and there's no reason to feel like it could never happen to me. Uh, or you know that I'm somehow flawed and incapable. You know I'm gonna just be a, a miserable person all my life. It's um, you know it's like we're all multimillionaires, uh, and you know s a lot of us just haven't discovered that we have that bank account that our great uncle left us. And uh, you know if, but it's there, and it's just a matter of sort of making the connection and you know going to the bank and and cashing in on it. Um, that that as you say heaven on earth is here there's a there's a vast reservoir of of fulfillment and joy and wisdom and bliss uh right in your own heart um there for the dipping into trip and i concluded the interview and then we couldn't help but keep talking and i realized at a certain point that, that we we're saying a lot of good stuff that should be added so if you see a kind of a sharp edit that seems out of context that's why, and the, the, the conversation that you are, are about to hear uh, will be what we did after we had finished. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Thank kind Rick. of a cognac at the end of the meal or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible that this is just a rock floating through space. There's nothing divine. Um, mm -hmm. That there is no, you know, um, profound, absolute awareness that is who we truly are and that it's a cruel, hard, cold rock in space, and it sucks, okay? That's a possible. Point. Certainly yeah. not my perception, nor yours, but no, it, we, that, we can hold it as a possibility. I agree. It, it, it cannot be disproven, okay? And then there's the other possibility that we hold is true, okay? Mm -hmm. The only reason that I'm uh, practicing, uh, the only reason that I'm holding with great conviction what we now hold to be true is because when I hold that with conviction, happiness manifests in my life with abundance okay yeah all right so so i actually don't know which is true but on a practical level i'm happier when i embrace one outlook as opposed to another when i i don't know whether aji shanti or ramana harshi or angaji has achieved some sort of deeper level of realization than i have okay i find that when i take make the assumption that no in fact they have not there's not a bit of daylight between us, and that the realization that I'm enjoying is that mm -hmm. I find that incredibly liberating, and I find it really quiets down um, the egoic outlook and um, puts me in a beautiful space of feeling that I, my God, Trip Overhold, have come home to this beautiful place, and it can't be improved upon. And no one else out there is enjoying some better space. This is absolutely beautiful, and it's as beautiful as it gets. And I think that that outlook is, if you're a happiness pragmatist, is the way to go. Now, it could be delusional, but nobody can know the answer to that question. So I say go for it. That's, what, that's my own view. You know? Okay, well, I have a couple things to say to that. One is, um, I think you might be putting the cart before the horse, because 
it's like a person could say, well, I have accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, therefore my life is full of joy. I, I have adopted this conviction, and it's made me joyful. Um, so I, maybe they're right when they say that, and maybe maybe adopting a particular um, concept, you know, okay, the world is full of joy and divinity, can actually make it real, as opposed to saying the world is a dead rock floating through space, you know, which could be rather depressing. But... I kind of think the reason I say cart before the horse is I think that um, it tends to be the the experience which um, engenders the con the conviction. In other words, if you're experiencing life in its magic quality and its you know beautiful uh, you know, beingness, divine quality, then sure that's what you believe. Uh, <laughs> you know, if you're if you're depressed and miserable and everything seems flat and material and empty then you're going to have that interpretation of it. And you had an uh, experiential realization quite unexpectedly, which shifted your worldview. You know, you picked up that Ramana Maharshi book, read a few pa passages, and all of a sudden you, were, you had tears streaming down your face and your experience changed. And it wasn't a big stretch for you after that to believe the sorts of things you've been saying. As far as the... Um, this thing about being exactly the same as at any you know great master who ever walked the earth, um, I'm okay with that. If it's it's not the way I tend to do it, I tend to like to think of myself as a beginner, even though I've been a spiritual practitioner for four and a half decades. But I, <laughs> I, I, um, I kind of I don't have a problem with hierarchies and looking up to or respecting people whom I feel are farther along than I am in the whole big picture scale of evolution, spiritual evolution. Um, it doesn't detract from my joy or my fulfillment or anything else, but I somehow feel it's actually more, for me, more honest and, and real, realistic, um, an understanding of things, because I do feel that there are, um, you know, uh, there are levels of, of spiritual development just as there are, you know, grades in school. Um, you know, the, th the third grader might be studying. No, a third grader might be studying a little bit of arithmetic or something like that. Doesn't mean that he's a, a postgraduate math, you know, student. Um, there are, uh, you know what I mean? I mean, I'm. Just I do know what you mean, but here's here's what I want to say to you. When when Jesus Christ was walking around, um, teaching and mm -hmm. telling ordinary folk that there was no difference between him and them. Right. And that they had this great opportunity at hand to be loved by loving one another and the whole teaching, right? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. if, if, if there is any validity to this thing that we're so interested in by that we want to promote mm -hmm. to the world, if there's any validity to it all, okay? Yeah. It cannot only be true at the end of some multi-decade, you know, effort spiritual effort or whatever it has to be true with a reasonable amount of spiritual effort and and jesus christ didn't go to these people and say you know if you if you work at this for a really long time like three or 40 30 or 40 years you can begin to come into the kind of space that i'm enjoying right now no he said basically it's here for the taking right here and now and i say that you are a wise man right here right now that you are like in the very cutting edge of of wisdom embodied and that you should go ahead and I say drop any idea that you have that you haven't completely arrived <laughs> well you know Jesus Christ said whatsoever great things I I do even greater things shall you do you know because I go unto my father and so on but um, he was the one walking on water and multiplying the loaves and fishes. It wasn't his disciples. He he had a certain spiritual maturity and, and authority and, and potency which allowed him to do those things if those things really happened. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's again the both and thing. While it's absolutely true that, you know, we're all the same thing and that on, on some level there's absolutely no difference, it's simultaneously true that there are degrees to which the degrees of mastery of that um, of not only the subjective realization of it but th the uh, you know the ability to sort of translate that into um, the world to go ahead 
Jesus said and Ramana said that the miracles that apparently happen um, around great sages like Christ are not produced by the sage. They are the byproduct of the immense faith that is brought to the sage by the ordinary individual in the presence of the miracle. And so mm. um, any miracle that, that you've experienced um, around some great sage or that you've read about was only possible because of the faith that you brought. You are the faith and you are the miracle. There's no separation between the miracle and you, and therefore you are, you are, you are that. You, yeah, no, it's, it's true. Um, you know, I'm always going to play devil's advocate on this point, uh, or rather, you know, sort of like contrarian, because, uh, you know, it's, it's the multifaceted truth thing. I you keep coming back to it. Um, I put, well, how can I say it any differently than I've said it? And I'm not trying to, like, convince you of anything or change your mind, because I feel like your perspective is perfectly valid. Um, I, I still, you know, like I said in the very beginning of the interview, if it's true that there are like 16 kalas, you know, which are kind of a rough roadmap of degrees of evolution and that human beings only reach the eighth and there are actually others above that, then, you know, being at, at, all, at all of those kalas, all of those levels, it's, it's only pure being. The rock is only pure being. Does the rock realize that? Well, not so much. The dog is only pure being. Does the dog realize that? Well, more than the rock. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the average human being, uh, the, the saint, uh, there's degrees of, of realization in the relative, insofar as, as consciousness or, or, or awareness is manifest in the relative, is experienced through relative forms, such as our bodies, our minds. There are degrees of experience, degrees of realization. As far as consciousness itself is concerned, no levels, no gradations, no degrees. It's all one amorphous wholeness with no differentiation within it. And that's ultimately the reality. Um, anything, any compromise with relativity is just a compromise with unreality for the sake of living, for the sake of discussion, uh, for the sake of understanding. But um, all of that is just really a story that that we tell ourselves and and the, in the final analysis you know there's only one of us and nothing is happening well i get your point i'm going to make my final counterpoint okay 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 as maybe it'll be final maybe i'll make you do another one <laughs> my final counterpoint is as long as there are, is there is, is there is a permanency mm -hmm. to the quality of your attention being at least partially placed on attention itself mm -hmm. like as you go through the day there's a portion of your attention that's remaining on your attention rather than on the objects and sensations and thoughts that are going through you, mm -hmm. which is true for me, and I think it's true for you. As long as that's the case, really the primary difference between a Nisargadatta, let's say, and you, in my opinion, mm -hmm. is the strength of, commi of conviction, both internal and external, with which that's expressed, okay? Nisargadatta was very intense about saying, you know, I am the beyond, I am the beyond, okay? Right. I look at these sages a lot of times, and I say, you know, the only difference between myself and some of these sages mm -hmm. is their willingness to get up there and say, I am absolutely the rock of God, the beyond, okay? They say it with a conviction that makes it easier for other people to believe. Well, that's, uh, that's one aspect of it. And the second aspect is that some of them are extremely gifted in the way they communicate this reality, okay? But I would say that the 99 percentile important aspect of it is whether or not there's a kind of permanency, a constancy in where the attention enjoys being. And if it enjoys being on itself, then you are a realized human being. And I say you should grant yourself that uh, fact. And I think in the granting of that fact to yourself, you become much more potent force for, uh, you become a much more potent mirror in the community because that conviction is palpable and it's contagious. Oh, that's true. And I think doubt can be a dry rot that kind of undermines one's, you know, realization. And, but I also think that honesty is important. 
Um, and if I go out on the street and say, I am the President of the United States, and if I shout that from the rooftops, it doesn't make me the President of the United States. Maybe that's not a fair analogy because we're talking about something that we all actually are, and we aren't all actually the President of the United States. Um, but there's, you know, Mariana Kaplan, whom I interviewed, wrote a nice book called um, Halfway Up the Mountain, The Error of Premature Claims to Awakening. And she and I had an interesting discussion about that. Um, it's, you know, just proclaiming oneself as awakened doesn't make it so. Uh, it's true on some level that we're all awakened, but in the sense that we're really talking about it, actual genuine awakening, just proclaiming it can just be a bravado, can just be a, you know, a silly kind of proclamation without any substance. And there are teachers, I think, who have gotten up and proclaimed themselves as awakened who very much were not. In the, in the Zen tradition, it's you know, customary to wait 10 years after awakening before before going out and teaching to just make sure it's it's genuine and it's stable and you know you, you know what you're doing um, so you know well Adi uh, Dav for example okay yeah uh -huh. he was awakened all right was not you say he was awakened was yes yes he was awakened mm -hmm. and yet the full range of narcissistic twisted behaviors um, yeah. came out of him and I don't need to get into them but all manner of sexual deviancy and drug use uh, and abuse. total sick stuff yeah I, I met a guy who had been with him for 17 years and I'm, I'm not talking about Samuel Bond or another guy and the laundry list of stuff that I did I was into is just sickening you know? yeah okay yeah. so um, despite all of that the man was awake because there was a constancy uh, to his realization of who he was okay yeah and, and so um, you know well you and I sit here, I, I sit here, and you sit here, and you call Adi Da awake, okay? Right. And yet, Adi Da was, you know, there were plenty of evenings out there where he had the cameras set up, and he was making his disciples fuck each other, and he was, you know, uh, screwing somebody's girlfriend that came in total innocence to him as a teacher, and blah, 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 right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. doing drugs and everything. And we, and, he, and that was, that kind of activity was going on like several nights a week or whatever, Mm -hmm. We sit here, and we know we sit here. In fact, for a fact, and we know that man was awake, and we we say that he was, and we say that he was because there was a constancy to his realization. I have a constancy to my realization, and you do as well. And I am not, I'm not going to parse out uh, Nisargadatta, Ramana, Adi Da, Adyashanti. Matter of fact, I don't think I don't think Ganga Ji's got any bit more of a realization over over me, for example. When I watch Gangaji do her thing, I see her really enjoying the adulation that she's receiving from people. Okay. You do see her enjoying? Yeah, I do. Yeah. And um, that's fine, but um, I also see them having I see them having an organization that brings a ton of money in as well. That's fine too. I'm not putting it down, but I don't think there's anything superior about the way that realization is playing out over the beautiful one-on-one uh, -on -one satsang and, and darshan that took place at my gathering here this, this past uh, July 3rd, where it was just a complete meltdown love fest. And I, I just, I don't, I don't see it. And I, I guess I have, a des I have a desire here that the, the, the beautiful light points of realization that are transpiring here, yourself a perfect example, I want to see more and more and more people like, and I'm not saying that you're not, but I want to see more and more people owning for themselves and acknowledging to themselves that yes, I have arrived home, I have come home to this beautiful reality, that's who I am. Yeah, well I, I, I can say that with confidence, um, yeah, and, and when we start getting the specifics and saying, you know, well this teacher or that teacher, it's difficult because it's hard to really know what's going on. But I think your Adi Da point illustrates a point I've been making all along, which is, to me, to my understanding, my way of seeing it, awakening in and of itself may not be worth a hill of beans uh, because it can be, uh, on, in the big picture of things, very preliminary. And teachers who set themselves up as masters and yet have a whole lot of screws loose, a whole lot of uh, blind spots that haven't been looked at, can do a lot of harm, and uh, are, in, you know, perhaps 
you, you mentioned karma earlier, are perhaps accruing karma for themselves that um, they're really going to have to go through some stuff to work off. Um, so to my view, you know, really mature spirituality means being uh, an, a complete embodiment of uh, all that is divine and, you know, not um, a, a loose cannon that's, you know, doing all kinds of crazy stuff and calling it wisdom. Um, but that's, so, I, that's so, I wouldn't reg so I don't care if somebody says they're awakened. It's, it's like they, they could be still in kindergarten in, in terms of what could be. But what the wizard would say, and I agree with him, and um, what these guys that we've interviewed say, is there is there is no saintly model of behavior that you can point to that then um, validates somebody's realization over somebody whose behavior doesn't look saintly. The behavior of the human being is not indic an indicator of realization. Yeah, and behavior can very much be a cultural thing. I mean, there's certain cultures in which it's perfectly appropriate to have multiple wives, for instance. The Pandavas, you know, were all married to one woman, and they in turn had other wives. Those are Arjuna and his brothers. And that was Indian culture in that, at, in that era. So there is that. Um, and so it's hard to sort of bring any absolute yardstick to it and say this behavior is right, this behavior is wrong. But I, I always have to do the but. I... Uh, I, and it, maybe it's just my own bias, you know. Um, and incidentally, I am recording this. I just started <laughs> the recording again because this is good stuff. Yeah. Um, but I, I just feel that there, we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. The, there is some legitimacy to the notion of saintliness. And, and a person could be saintly, like Mother Teresa, and not realized. A person could be realized, like Adida, and not saintly. But... Um, I think the ideal package is possible, which is to have both, to have that sort of realization and to have the, the culturing of the relative personality such that one really is a blessing to the world and an inspiration to the world. Um, and, uh, you know, and again, it doesn't have to be a famous person, could be a, a, an unknown person, but there, there is something to be said for culturing all levels of life, absolute and relative and all levels of the personality. And like Ken Wilber, for instance, who actually was an Adidas student uh, and talks about lines of development, you know, he, he kind of puts forth the notion that certain lines of development, say the, the consciousness line, the awakening line, can be very developed, and other lines can be really stunted and, un, and totally undeveloped. And I believe he's an advocate of somehow bringing all the lines into their, their full development and not having that kind of lopsided thing like <laughs> we, we saw with Adida. Well, if I, um, if, if I were ag agreeing with your perspective of uh -huh. and um, using my own life as an example uh, to, take your, to take your argument and to agree with it and then to use my life in, as an example, I, I was exhibiting, say, a, a significant or obnoxious personality trait five years ago than I am now. Okay? And around me would agree okay and those obnoxious personality traits were not dropped by directly looking at them and saying i don't like that i need to get rid of that and sort of trying to become more saintly those obnoxious traits dissolved of their own through a much greater loving acceptance of the entire basket of obnoxious guy called trip that i was <laughs> and so if one wanted really done with your view on this, yeah. there is a saintly yeah. model of being to be aspired to. The fastest way to get there is to completely radically accept your obnoxious complete basket of crap, and it will take care of itself. And then there'll be a natural cohesion between you and people that like to be around nice people. But I don't think that it's true that the presence of those obnoxious behaviors invalidates your realization or makes you less realized than someone who's more saintly. No, I agree with that. In fact, I just that's really what I was 
saying with the, with your my comments about your the Adida point. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying yeah. his, his decadent behavior was um, refuted his, the the legitimacy of his realization. Yeah. I'm just saying that um, his lines of development were very askew, very imbal unequally um, prog progressed, and that evolution continues you know there's this force of evolution that is relentless and yeah. untiring and it's going it, if one line has has been has been developed it's going to work on the other lines and okay. um and so your obnoxious tendencies that you confess to you know uh, perhaps your realization really brought some juice to the to the resolution of those, which you know you didn't have the capacity to resolve before your re your your realization, and that's great. I think it's also per and, and you know Marshi used to use the example of watering the root of a tree rather than watering all of its individual leaves, and you'd take care of all the leaves simultaneously that way. So in other words, get to the transcendent, get to your, get to the self-realization, and then all the personality stuff and the morality and the health and everything else is going to work itself out. That didn't turn out to be entirely true in practice, either in his case or in all of his students' cases. Um, and, and so there could be some validity to actually giving specific attention to a particular leaf that looks withered, you know, doing some kind of therapy for this or that hang up or, or you know, whatever. Uh, point made. I agree. I agree. My only point is here you are, you're a beautiful, I'm, 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 I'm just, you're a beautiful man. You've got, looks like a successful marriage. You are, you've got a refinement into the fine points of reality like very few people on the planet. You're doing this beautiful show. I mean, when the hell do you get to acknowledge to yourself that you're living in Christ consciousness 20 more years from now? Like 80, when you're 85? No, I can say that now. And I can also say yeah. that, you know, as things tend to be progressing, 20 years from now, I'll even be in a better state. You know, it's like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a problem with that. It, 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 okay. Because it's my experience, for God's sake, okay. you know? It's like, it would be unrealistic of me to say otherwise. Because, hey, I'm, a, I'm in a much better place now than I was 10 years ago, or 10 years before that, or 10 years before that. And so, I, uh, and even though the, there's the essence of it is exactly the same now as it was when I was four years old, and I can recognize that, uh, the the appreciation of that essence and the manifestation of that essence continues to evolve. That's my experience. Okay. Yeah. And well, I, and I'll bet it's yours. I'll bet it's yours. I'll bet you ten years from now. You know, if you look listen to this interview, you'll think, well, I'll be darned. You know, uh, there's been a lot of growth in the last ten years, and it's e things are even groovier now than they were then. Even though then was just fine. You know, completely perfect as it was. It's even perfecter now. <laughs> it's true. But you know what? It's like um, uh, both both you and I are like uh, a bit of yogurt culture right now. Um, our yogurt culture may get stronger. Uh, it may become, you know, an award-winning yogurt culture. But right now, my yogurt culture has been dropped into the milk of a few young people out here, and I mean, in the world. And I have I. I and the, the, I will say, the absence of trip, needing to fill the egoic identity called trip with other people's, you know, um, affirmations, not of who I am truly, but of trip, you know, of my skill mm -hmm. sets and whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. The dissolution of trip has taken place sufficiently, even at this early stage, which I recognize early on in this, in this ever-going process to which you speak, such that I absolutely have been a... Um, instrument of awakening and of profound shift in some people out there, right? Yeah. So, hey, me too. You, sure. you have too. Well, what the hell, man? I mean, you've already been an instrument of freaking incredible service out there. I mean, I just want you to acknowledge it. I mean, honestly, oh, yeah. you I, I somehow I give, I do give people the impression that I'm still this desperate seeker, you know, who hasn't accepted my own realization. And so maybe it's just the way I ask questions because I, you know, I'm asking questions which I kind of know the answers to, but I want to ask them because I like to see what people say. Um, and also I have this theme that I keep harping on of, you know, there's, but wait, there's more. <laughs> and right. uh, so that could seem very um, seekerish, you know, and very kind of unfulfilled. 
but it's not that. There's a there's a foundation of fulfillment which is unshakable, and which I fully acknowledge, a uh, foundation of realization and so on. Um, uh, but I just always, you know, on the other hand, it's like Fiddler on the Roof. Remember, he would, his daughter would come to him and say she, she no. wanted something, and he would say, absolutely no. not. But then he would say, on the other hand, uh, so there's just always that, it's the way I think. Well, there's two, there's two kinds of humility that um, can take place. There's a, kind, there's a humility that can be expressed where somebody is kind of, feeling the responsibility for sharing with others that, gee, I'm just an ordinary guy called Trip. You know, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not God's gift to humanity. You know, I'm not mm-hmm. the sharpest tool in the shed. And, you know, um, and, and to me, like giving much attention to that kind of humility or expressing that kind of humility is a kind of false humility because what it really is is a kind of egoic backdoor substitute for the deeper humility of actually witnessing the divine in every single person and thing that comes into my into my field of of experience right and so like there's no need nor do i think it's true of say you that um you're a flawed human being you're an absolutely perfect human being and there's no need to sort of um, emotionally uh, give any uh, added weight to the fact that you're a flawed human being who's in a spiritual process. Everyone, Ramana Maharshi was a flawed human being who was in a spiritual process. You're a flawed human being who's in a spiritual process. As long as you're recognizing the divinity of everyone that you come in contact with, then you're being truly humble. I mean, you're being totally humble. And then I think that that self-declaration should be made that you have, you are that. You have arrived. You are. Absolutely. You know. It's like I said before with the three levels. You know, when we were talking about the starving children. You know, on, on a certain level, I'm a flawed human being. You know, I'm not perfect on certain <laughs> by a long shot in many ways. On another level, I'm perfect, absolutely divine, just as I am. On another level, I don't even exist. There is no me. You know, there is no uh, Rick. There is no universe. It's it's absolute unmanifest, you know, potentiality that never arose. And all those things are simultaneously true. And I just tend not to lock into any one of them. So, and I can jump from one to the other. So I can, you know, I can, you know, say them all in a single paragraph, and I just did. (laughs) Well, okay, and I get it. So we've beat this to the point, but I have locked into a perspective. You know, mm-hmm. I've locked into the one that is not a shred of daylight between Ram and Harshi and myself. Mm-hmm. That um, I totally get it. I am a realized human being. I am divine, and everyone and everything that I come in contact with is divine. And I am locked onto that because being locked onto that has produced an incredibly rapid rate of spiritual maturation. Well, that's great. And so, you know. and so I'm I'm recommending. That's why I'm I'm so forcefully recommending it because. Mm-hmm. I think that anyone that adopts that perspective will find the same accelerated rate of spiritual maturation. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. That's, yeah. You know. No, that's all right. Would you recommend that for all fields of endeavor, or just spirituality? Would you say that uh, on s- that you're, there's no there's not a shred of daylight between you and um, you know Andre Agassi or, or Ro- Roger Federer? And, uh, you know, or is there a ba- big gulf there term in terms of tennis ability? Well, it'd be like. Um, uh, it's kind of like um, which is a more relevant fact that the dream if I'm, if I'm having a dream and there's a character in my dream called Andre Agassi so you can beat the crap out of a tennis ball and then I'm dreaming up this other character called Trip and um, Agassi has invited me to play with him and he's like you know whipping these you know shots past me and everything which, <laughs> which is the more uh, salient fact that you know uh, that guy can play tennis better than me, or the fact that I'm the dreamer who's dreamed up all the characters. So the utter absolute equality of being the dreamer is the only fact that has any real weight. And these relative facts that a guy can uh, play tennis better or whatever, to me, are not facts that I care to give much attention to anymore because they're not going to um, bring me peace. You know? 
No, and I agree with that. And it's like I said before when I brought up the, th the different levels. Ultimately, the, the deepest level of consideration is the truest. And the others are just sort of concessions to yes. relativity for the sake of discussion, for the sake of living, and so on. They're not ultimately true. We can't afford to dismiss them. We don't ignore the starving children because by, by saying that they don't really exist and nothing needs to happen and everything's perfect, we, we feed them. But ultimately, they're not true. There are no starving children. Mm -hmm. um, right. Well, the second book that I read after um, I was turned on was I Am That by Nisargadatta. Nisargadatta, right? right. And he said what happened was that his teacher told him, you are that, right? Yeah, no good point. And he just hung on to that for dear life like a pit bull. He said, I believed my teacher. Mm -hmm. He said, this is the only thing you have to do is you have to believe that you are that. And he said, I believed it with every fiber of my body and I gave mm -hmm. my attention to that truth for three years, right? Yeah. And finally, it became absolutely true of who I was, right? Very good. Now, the point well taken. Now, I think you, you've scored a, um, you, you finally got one past Roger Federer there. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> no, there's a lot of, there's, it really, no, that's a great substantiation of, of the point you've been making. And um, I'll swing over to your side of the, of the fence here for a bit and, and acknowledge the, the value in having that conviction that you that you've just been saying i don't think it refutes the things i've been saying but it definitely uh gives uh gives importance to the emphasis that, that you've made i want to thank you for having me on your show and um i want to say that you're my favorite interviewer oh, oh no you're my favorite interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> you're my go-to guy whenever i was like there were some books that i didn't read you know uh -huh. and i would go to your I'd go to your program and I'd so, download uh, your... Huh? Yeah, so I was the Cliff Notes. <laughs> you were the Cliff Notes. <laughs> and um, I love what you do, and, I'm, and I love that you're passionate about it, and people love being on your show. It's all good, brother, and it's, it's been wonderful you know, being with you and sharing with you, and I thank you. Well, thank you, Trip. Let me make a couple of concluding remarks. Um, I, as you, most people are aware by this time, I've been conducting an interview with Trip Overholt, um, who has his own interview show, although he isn't doing it anymore, but you may resume it at some point. Um, but all the interviews are still there on the internet, which and I'll be linking to them so you can find them. Um, he also has a book which uh, puts in print the some of the highlights of those interviews, about 32 different ones, and I'll be linking to that. Um, if you have enjoyed this interview and would like to be notified of others you can either subscribe to the YouTube channel or you can sign up for a little email notification thing on my site I think there's a little tag that says subscribe to our newsletter or something and the only emails you'll ever get are just once a week when I post a new interview you'll be notified uh, it this also exists as a podcast so you can listen in audio I was just talking to a woman the other day that recognized me at that event I went to and said, hey, you're the Buddha at the gas pump. Oh, you're Rick, right? I said, yeah. And she said, she said, I clean houses for a living, and, and I just have my iPod, and I listen to your interviews all day long while I'm cleaning houses. So that kind of th was heartwarming. Um, next week, I will be interviewing Andrew Cohen, who has an interesting take on some of the things Tripp and I have been talking about, about the, the complete you know, fulfillment of being and yet the sort of the urgency of, of becoming in terms of an evolutionary imperative toward, you know, deeper and uh, newer forms of expression of, of, uh, of evolution. He obviously expresses it a lot better than I do. So we'll be talking about that with him. So hope you'll listen and thank you for watching and we'll see you next week. Thank you, brother. Thanks, Trip. Thank you.